Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jing Liang. I'm a friend of uh, Dr. Jose Basalga, uh, who uh, coordinated this tribute with uh, Jose's friends and family. Uh, this tribute is organized by his friends. It's not a AstraZeneca associate sponsor event, but we do want to thank AstraZeneca for providing the meeting support. Um, it's been super helpful. I We would not have been able to pull this off ourselves. So I wanted to thank everyone for spending your Saturday with us to celebrate the amazing life of uh, Dr. Baselga. He was a great scientist, a uh, great husband, father, and, and a relentless champion of human progress, especially in cancer care. He contributed to 12 approved cancer drugs, which must be a world record for any drug developer. Um, and, and as a drug developer myself, you know, it's, he's, he's my North Star in trying to set the bar for you know, what I want to achieve in, in my life. Um, I do not know Jose as long as some of you, uh, you all have. And therefore, I will reserve the majority of time to Jose's friends who have known him for you know, more than 30 years. And with that said, I will... Uh, pass it to the first speaker, Anas Yunes. Anas, do you want to start? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I first met Jose um, when we started our uh, internal medicine uh, residency together at um, uh, SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn and Kings County Hospital, one of the toughest probably residency programs in, in the country, as some of you probably know. Um, uh, during the first year um, of residency, five of us um, knew that we want to be oncologists. And um, since that time, we kept close um, relationship and connection uh, over time um, and friendship that evolved actually and get, get stronger with time. Um, the difference uh, for Jose though that he not only knew that he wants to be an oncologist, he knew exactly where he wanted to do his training and how to get there, which is a remarkable differentiating item, I think, uh, um, early on in, 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 in his life. Um, he decided he wants to be trained at Memorial. Uh, and to do so, he worked hard on it. Um, he started going uh, weekends to work on research projects at Memorial. He figured out who are the uh, key players and, and investigators to work with. And I remember uh, his first two week vacation, um, he spent it on a project, a uh, research project at Memorial, um, I think with Mark, Chris and Dick Grala in, in lung cancer. That's before he be evolved to become a, a breast cancer uh, uh, expert. And at the end of the vacation, uh, I saw him coming um, uh, down to a ground round um, a meeting at Downstate with a big poster rolled uh, under his arm and, and very happy um, telling me that this is a poster that he was going to present at the AACR, um, uh, which was really remarkable for someone like him at that stage when most of us didn't know what AACR was at that, at that time. Um, so when then we be, you know, became fellows at Memorial, uh, uh, we bonded together because we came from the same residency program and we have a admiration for each other uh, for, every time one of us do something. Um, and it evolved with time and over the next uh, 30 years or so, uh, more of a like an innocent, I think, uh, sibling rivalry. Um, um, over time, he would text me or email me or call me whenever he did something first, and I would do the same. It, it, it came to who uh, had the first paper published in the England Journal, who got their drug first approved. But of course, with time, no one could keep up with Jose. I couldn't keep up with him. You know, just like one after one after achievement, one after achievement, which is a remarkable what he did uh, over the uh, the uh, the the journey. And then by the end of the fellowship, um, you know, uh, we started looking for careers and jobs and faculty positions. I uh, took a position at MD Anderson, and he stayed at Memorial. Um, but um, for me, I, I moved to MD Anderson early before completing the you know, three years of fellowship, which is usually finishes in June to start your new, next career in July because they wanted me to start earlier. So I started at MD Anderson in April. Um, so knowing that I will miss the graduation dinner and ceremony and so forth, uh, Jose asked me to come to his apartment to have a drinks about one week before uh, I moved to uh, Texas. So I went there, I got a bottle of wine, and I think it's Saturday, and went there. 
a beautiful apartment in the United Nations Plaza that Sylvia, his wife, uh, had um, at that time through her um, uh, job in, in the Spanish bank, you know, high rise building, condo overlooking the East River and bridges and all of kind of things. So I walk in, you open the door, walk in, and it's really like a scene from a movie. Everyone in the fellowship and my year was there. It was a surprise farewell party, brought their spouses and was one of the most, I think, memorable evenings I had um, um, uh, during that time. And I still remember exactly what music they were playing. And Sylvia probably would remember that too. They were playing Natalie Cole, uh, Unforgettable, which was just released, I think about a month ago uh, at that time. And every time I, I hear Natalie Cole singing, whatever I'm in a taxi or like in a hotel lobby or on the radio, it always brings out a uh, memory uh, of that evening that uh, I will cherish for a long time. And finally, one more story I'd like to mention uh, about uh, uh, Pepe. Um, when um, uh, he moved to Mass General um, uh, to be the chief of uh, Himonk, uh, of course, he was happy and started to do what Jose do all the time, restructuring, recruiting. And um, so he called me to um, um, ask me about who should he recruit for uh, chief of uh, hematology. And I was still at, uh, at MD Anderson in Houston. And so we talked about a few names and at the end he said, why did you consider this opportunity? This would be really great for you. And we worked together again and so forth. And um, I told Jose, you know, I, thank you for thinking of me, but this sounds like a recipe to ruin our uh, friendship, working uh, uh, for you as a boss. Um, so, you know, obviously we let it go. And, and one year later, I was recruited uh, to a memorial uh, to be chief of lymphoma. And a few months later, he was recruited uh, to memorial to be the physician in chief. So he became my boss anyways, you know. And um, not only it did not ruin our friendship, it actually strengthened it, but um, it gave me a fresh um, uh, look to witness how brilliant he is, um, how smart, how dedicated, um, how um, uh, visionary he was uh, uh, um, uh, at that time. So um, when, when he moved to AstraZeneca and I followed him at that time with absolutely no reservation because I knew what he could do and how, how good the place would be. Uh, um, I will certainly miss Jose a lot. Um, and it's not, not easy to see him uh, go away after 35 years of friendship. Um, um, he will be missed by so many people, I can tell you that. Um, uh, I'm sure uh, he started to work uh, now in, in, in heaven, uh, restructuring, and then uh, probably he fired one or two angels by now. Um, but I hope he'll take it easy this time with the recruitment. Uh, um, but um, um, I, I will miss him uh, very dearly. And, and, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to talk. Thank you. So um, I guess I'm next. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is John Curry. I'm a physician scientist at MD Anderson. And Jose and I met as medical oncology fellows at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he, he's really one of my dearest friends. And I really cherish this opportunity to share a few memories of Jose. I think I can give a little more insight into some of the time he spent as a postdoc and then during the first few years at Val de Braun. So Jose did his postdoc training in John Mendelssohn's lab. And during those years, we actually shared a lab bench. And as anyone knows who's done experiment, experimental work, it's much like a roller coaster ride. In the morning, you have joy. In the afternoon, everything falls apart in tribulation. So Jose and I actually shared those experiences and developed a very fast friendship. And quite honestly, in the lab, Jose worked harder than anybody. Um, but beyond that, he had these intuitive abilities that we just didn't have. First of all, he recognized that Mendelssohn's monoclonal antibody against EGFR was going to be very important. Not many people really believed that at the time. It was the forerunner of cetuximab, which is the four, one of the first effective targeted agents in cancer. And this was just one of many winners that Jose picked. He really was a true visionary when it came to identifying agents that were going to change the face of cancer therapeutics. So during our postdoc fellowship, I had the pleasure of visiting Jose and Silvia on holiday in Spain. We went to Silvia's uh, family home on the coast of Brava, just a beautiful place, 
set amongst the olive groves on the coast, Sylvia's parents were just incredibly hospitable. I remember Sylvia's mom served this amazing paella dish according to her family recipe. And dinner was like at something like 10 p.m. You know, an American, that's kind of late, but uh, I was being immersed in the Catalan uh, culture. And then after that, we went to a party at a nightclub on the coast. And we were there all night long, you know, drinking and having a great time. And then just before dawn, we got into somebody's speedboat and went to this huge seaside cavern, actually got inside this, and we turned around and just watched the sunrise. It was an amazing experience, just beautiful. And I remember saying to Jose during that trip that he had such a wonderful life in Spain, and I just couldn't understand why he gave it up to come to the US. And he told me that his father really encouraged him to go out in the world to realize his dreams. And I think his dad had a very strong, uh, he was a very strong motivator in his life. So during those postdoc years, Jose and I traveled to many scientific conferences together. Um, we usually shared a room to reduce costs, and we continued that tradition well into our professional careers. Our favorite meetings were the Keystone Symposia. The science at those things was outstanding, but more importantly, they were held at the best ski resorts. Uh, skiing was just second nature to Jose. He just loved attacking mogul fields. The larger the moguls, the better. And then in later years, Sylvia also came to those meetings and watching the two of them dance down those mogul fields was really great fun. And Sylvia was every bit the match for Jose on the slopes. And I can tell you, she's also a very good golfer. She joined us on many occasions. I also had the pleasure of visiting Jose and Sylvia soon after Jose took a job at Val de Bron in Barcelona. This time we actually went to the Pyrenees where they had a, a home. Uh, growing up, Jose spent a lot of time in the Pyrenees. Uh, he was quite used to hiking and doing things in the mountains. And Jose organized a hike up a mountain called Pedra Forca, which is in the Pyrenees. And we were joined by several of Jose's friends who were very serious mountain climbers. And if they can show you my first slide, here's a picture of the mountain. Right there, it's gorgeous, magnificent, kind of the forked peaks there. Um, and then the next slide actually shows the route up the mountain. You see a little blue line turning into a red and then green? Yeah, I mean, that was really uh, kind of a, a shocker for me. I mean, I grew up hiking in the uh, Colorado Rockies, but I was absolutely not prepared for this. But when we actually finished, Jose looked at me with this big smile and said, you survived, John. And this is just an example of how Jose really clearly lived life to the fullest. So when Jose arrived at Valdebron, they had absolutely nothing in the way of cancer research. But as everyone knows, through his tireless work he did as a department chair, he put Valdebron on the map, not just in Europe, but around the world. And at scientific meetings, everyone wanted to meet with Jose to develop collaborations. And I was still his loyal roommate, and I witnessed the phone in our room literally ringing off the hook. And he was usually not in the room. He was usually out and about developing collaborations. So I took a lot of messages. And I can tell you, those little pads of paper next to the phone are just not enough to handle those messages for Jose. So his accomplishments did not escape the world's attention. Uh, MD Anderson and a number of other institutions honored him with a number of awards. And during one of those visits to MD Anderson, Jose interrupted his busy itinerary to make a quick trip to our house. Our daughter, Alex, had just been born and Jose wanted to see the baby <coughs> and uh, deliver a gift from Sylvia. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a beautiful, <coughs> little outfit that became her, her Sunday best. And she's, and the next slide is a picture of her sporting that little outfit. Um, so Jose made a lot of great decisions in life, but in my opinion, his greatest decision was to ask Sylvia to marry him. Jose told me many times that he could not have achieved what he did in life without Sylvia's wise counsel. She was his best friend and confidant. So in recent years, uh, I've still kept in touch with Jose, albeit probably not quite as much. 
Um, I happened to meet and become good friends uh, with Clint Eastwood. That's sort of a story in and of itself. And Jose absolutely loved Clint Eastwood films. And he always asked me what I'd heard from Clint. So the day Jose died, I was actually returning from a trip to California to celebrate our daughter's 18th birthday. And Clint actually attended that party. And here's a picture of that party. Our daughter is to Clint's right there. As you can see, our baby's now all grown up. I, the next day, I traveled uh, to the airport to return home, and I actually emailed this picture to Jose. And minutes later, I received an email from Honest telling me that Jose had just passed away. <clears throat> so it's very hard for me to express my feelings about Jose. Simply put, he was a dear brother and dear friend. Uh, he, you know, Jose was deep down a Catalan and Spaniard, but he was also a real American success story. He came to this country with absolutely no connections, no influence, but he had a deep-seated belief in himself. And he knew he could shine in the toughest and most competitive environments. He asked only for an opportunity and prove himself he did. Ask anyone in the field of cancer research and they'll tell you he was brilliant. Ask his family and they'll tell you he was a devoted husband and dad. And right now, we're absolutely struggling with this reality that Jose is no longer here. It just doesn't seem possible. What I do know for sure is that the world is a much better place because of Jose. And I'm really fortunate to call Jose my friend. Thank you. Good afternoon. For those who don't know me, my name is Eulalia Baselga, Lali, as everyone calls me and I'm Jose's little sister and a pediatric dermatologist. I am the youngest of four, and Pepe, as we call him, the eldest, and my role model. Though medicine runs in our blood like an autosomal dominant trait, since my grandfather and father were physicians, our mother is a nurse, and four of my five children are currently studying medicine, I am a physician because of Pepe. I first discovered the depth of Pepe's strength when he was run over by a car at the age of 13. Many of you may not know this because he never complained about it, but he was in bed rest for three months. He broke countless of bones and required several surgeries. In order to keep up with his skill work, he was able to organize teams of classmates who came over every afternoon to teach him whatever lessons he had missed. Pepe's leadership and optimism in face of challenges translated to many aspects of our lives. He dragged all of us to Boy Scouts, got us excited about the prospect of skiing even though we had never gone, and collected money so we could buy a dog altogether. Unfortunately, since I was the youngest and I had no money, I was only able to pitch in for the tail. And when him and Luis, my other brother, wanted to tease me, they would only let me touch the duck's tail. Pepe's energy, leadership, and optimism translated to my career. In my first year of medical school, my friends could not understand that I was already reading New England's uh, case records of Mass General. They could not understand that I was studying with the latest versions of Harrison's, Guyton, Nelson's Pediatrics, instead of sticking to the Spanish versions of these books. And they could not understand why I was taking the steps so early in my career, just in case I wanted to complete my education in the United States. And the reason behind all of these behaviors, of course, was Pepe. Because I always strived to be like him and always took his advice. As the years went on, we started to develop similar habits. I realized that we both have a deep love for coffee, an uncanny ability to leave Max all over the place, and an insatiable capacity to work be at 5 a.m. in the morning or at midnight. People will comment on these similarities, sometimes alarmed at the intensity of our work ethic. 
and I would beam with joy at the thought of being just like my older brother. When Pepe was an intern in Kids County in Brooklyn, he invited me to visit his dorm at the hospital, which was the size of a working closet, had almost no furniture, and a window that in the middle of January did not close properly. The room was frigid. As soon as I walked in, he asked me, don't you think it's a fantastic room? I wanted to cry. While Pepe stuffed me endlessly on the academic front, it was these lessons of humbleness, of optimism, and of dreaming big in his everyday life that stuck with me the most. Pepe made a living serving others. And like a candle, he illuminated those around him with his burning passion, with the same selflessness a candle withers away to keep those around it warm. I'm going to miss stopping by Boston or New York every year on my way to the American Academy of Dermatology to spend a couple of days with him and Sylvia. Those visits with Pepe gave me enough fuel to keep on going for a whole year. He would, we would talk about everything. He would inject me with optimism and I would come back feeling very loved and with a clear vision of what, uh, of the next steps to achieve my personal and professional goals. I will miss our biannual reunions at La Cerdanya for Christmas and summer, to spend time with our children and sing childhood songs. But I'm also certain that he has prepared me to keep on going, to keep th thriving as a doctor, mother, daughter, and above all, as his sister. Thank you, I think it's uh, my opportunity to speak. I'm Cliff Huddis. Uh, I've uh, known Jose for at least uh, uh, or about 30 years. I'm not sure precisely when we met. I assume it was 1989 or 90. He was a year behind me in fellowship in the class with John and Annis. Um, but I do know when Jose became a fixture in, in my life. And that was really as he uh, began to focus on breast cancer and on the development of trastuzumab. This was the early 90s. Uh, he was working in John Mendelssohn's lab, mentored by John and by Larry Norton, exploiting uh, this new monoclonal antibody, and in particular, uh, its use in combination with chemotherapy for early stage and, and advanced breast cancer. Um, you all know that success story, and I'm not going to reiterate it here, but I do think that that was a blueprint for what he tried and succeeded at doing over and over again uh, throughout the rest of his career, as you've heard. Now, uh, already many ha have recounted uh, and will recount stories of Jose's vision, his drive, his persistence and impact, all of which make him for sure one of the most influential oncologists in a generation. I could easily do that too. Um, his extraordinary and rapid promotion in one step, nobody does this, from instructor at Memorial to professor and chair at uh, Val de Braun in, in the uh, 1990s. His election to the board of ASCO in 2003 followed quickly thereafter by ESMO and AACR. And of course, his hand in producing so many actionable insights that changed cancer care around the world and more. That extraordinary professional career is very briefly summarized by me and known to you all. But I want to focus on something else now, and that is uh, his love of life, his love of family, and his life outside of work. And I will just give you a little spoiler alert. Uh, this story ends with us swimming naked in East Hampton. So you may uh, all wonder, uh, how did that come to be, uh, even if you don't want to picture it quite <laughs> precisely? Um, so let me expand a little bit. Jose was effusive in his love for his family and his friends. He relished, as you've already heard from John Curry, extraordinary opportunities 
and the experiences that life could bring. He loved, as you heard from Anas already, uh, how uh, to, to entertain graciously, and they never, he never missed a chance to do so. In sum, he always found ways to expand his friend's world outside of work and outside of medicine. And from the beginning, all I ever wanted to do was somehow reciprocate that level of generosity, uh, but it was a challenge. Jose shared a world and experiences, at least with uh, me and my family, that I'd never seen before, some memories to share. A long weekend in Barcelona soon after he moved to Val de Bran, when many of us went collectively to celebrate the launch of the program he was building at Val de Bran. This was followed by an extraordinary weekend in the neighboring countryside with food and fun and medieval art that I had only imagined seeing before. A meeting in Leon, Spain, where, and this is important, he introduced me, unknowing myself about wine, to the Spanish red wine, Rioja. Uh, I remember that first taste and I've loved it ever since and always associate it with Jose. Uh, whenever I have the opportunity to order it, I do, and it will always make me think of him. A trip with our children uh, to, uh, to Rome with Sylvia, and that's what's pictured, I think, on the slide here, um, where, um, Jose and I were supposed to give lectures on a Saturday morning at 10 a.m. In, in, uh, at a Rome, Roman hospital. Uh, but of course, as many of you know, in, in Italy, especially on a Saturday, uh, start time is just a suggestion. So Jose and I ended up uh, sitting for two hours drinking espresso, waiting not just for the audience, but the organizers to show up for this uh, symposium. Uh, eventually they did, but behind the scenes, poor Silvia was stuck with these uh, three young charges uh, touring uh, Rome. And to this day, uh, our, our children now in their late 20s uh, talk about how they saw Rome and how they saw it with Sylvia. And it was her grace under pressure uh, that, that just amazed me. Uh, she was unflappable, of course. Later, a morning in Barcelona with one of my sons when I was there for a meeting and Jose canceled all of his work plans for the day and took us on a bike tour of Barcelona. So uh, that, that was a special uh, kind of a welcome. And one of my favorite stories, not so much about Jose, but indeed about Spanish life was uh, when I was on a plane delayed to a meeting in Seville in the south of uh, Spain. Uh, there was a faculty dinner planned for Friday night, and my plane didn't arrive until 11.30 uh, because of the delay. I got off the plane. I phoned Jose. He said, I'm so sorry to miss dinner. And he said, what are you talking about? We're just getting ready to leave the hotel. Um, just go straight to the restaurant and meet us, and you'll be in time to order appetizers. Um, and, and the point of this, of course, is uh, this was about expanding a world experience and learning that there are lots of lifestyles and ways to live and enjoy and love life. And that was what Jose brought to, to, to at least to my life. And finally, in that vein, um, my wife Jane and I talk about this all the time. A long weekend with Oscar and Cora in Mallorca uh, seems like from everything I hear, a pretty routine event for the Basalgas, but for us, it was just an extraordinary weekend of three hour lunches and siesta and four hour dinners in one home more grand than the other uh, and with people more gracious and welcoming than, than uh, the ones before. So all of this uh, with Jose and with Sylvia uh, taught us uh, about the opportunity to, to seize every moment to warmly welcome friends into your life and, and to share your experiences in ways that just broaden and enrich all of life. So back to East Hampton and swimming naked, I tried to reciprocate. Uh, and one hot summer uh, afternoon, it was, it was uh, we were at a meeting in Washington, Jose and I, and I think he was in Boston by then. Uh, Sylvia, of course, it being summer and her being a smart European was certainly not in the United States by that point. And Jose was stuck here alone. So we got on the shuttle and we flew up to LaGuardia, drove out to East Hampton, at which point um, we were several hours ahead of my wife. And I realized that I and Jose did not have bathing suits. We were hot. We were sweaty. Um, we had been working all day and the swimming pool was glimmering right outside uh, the deck of, of our home. So all I can tell you all is uh, we drank beer and we went swimming. And um, that love of life and that ability to, to uh, roll with the punches and uh, just have a good time, I think is something that um, um, 
not everybody would have seen in the professional world uh, from Jose, but it really was so much part of him. Now, from all of that and all the stories about uh, his, his travels and entertaining and uh, living large, you may wonder when he had time for work and so much productivity. And, and I, I have to say, sometimes I did as well, but the truth of course is he was extraordinarily smart and organized and focused. Um, the last time I saw Jose uh, for any length of time was just before the lockdown for, for COVID-19, we had dinner uh, down in, in Washington. And I will uh, always remember that dinner because he was happy at work. He was bursting with pride in the success of his uh, children, and he was excited about what was coming next in life. So my answer to the question, how will I honor his legacy, is in part the same way as so many of all of you on this, uh, uh, on the, at this memorial. I will work hard uh, to try to uh, fulfill some of the quest that, that he uh, was on to, to meet the challenges of cancer, of course. And the second way is that I will always uh, choose Rioja. It goes with everything and its taste will always remind me of uh, what Jose taught me about how to expand the world and, and make life richer and more fun for everybody. Thank you. Okay, I guess it's uh, Menti's turn now. Um, um, actually, uh, what Jose would have told me now is, Mauri, in a talk of five, 10 minutes, you have to write every single word. You cannot afford to impro improvise. Um, I write down something, uh, not every single word, but uh, I, I wanted to talk about some stuff that happened in the Valderon, in MGH, and in memorials. So um, I met Jose on uh, September 27, 2004. Uh, I gave a talk in Valderon. I was invited by Joaquina Ribas. And um, I was going to accept uh, a position in San Juan de Deu. Uh, when I think Eulalia works now. Uh, and, uh, but you know, I had friends in Barcelona, so they were, they said, you know, if you're coming, if you're coming over, why don't you give us a talk? And I did, it wasn't a great talk. Jose was in the audience. Uh, and after the talk, Joaquin brought me to his office, like Dr. Bazelga wants to talk to you. And after 40 minutes, I got a job offer. And I had 72 hours to talk, to, to, to think about it which now I know is a long time for him. And um, he wanted me to start on October 1st. It was September 27 and I was living in another country. So this, this is how Jose was. He hated wasting time. He hated mediocrity. He didn't uh, want to anything that was not heading towards perfection. So Valdebron, talking about perfection, I remember I was one of the few PhD, maybe the only one PhD that went to uh, the oncologist meeting. And uh, I think they were on Monday morning because I wanted to you know, I know everything about all the phase ones and, 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 and translational research. And uh, there is one thing that everyone feared, every mentee of Jose feared is when you got a message from ASCO or ACR or ESMO that you got an oral presentation, you know, 99% of the people would, I mean, they also uh, were laughing of joy, but they knew what was going to be uh, the rehearsal with Jose. And it was comic in a way, and it was fantastic in another way to see it. And I remember Francesco at Soria, an oncologist that did the rehearsal for his ASCO presentation. It was a, an antibody, the phase one, of an antibody against insulin like growth factor receptor. And Jose patiently waited the end of the, of the rehearsal. And he said, Francesco, this talk is okay. You can go to ASCO tomorrow and give this speech and you would be okay. The problem is I don't like okay. I, I just don't like okay. I'm just not going to cope with okay. So then you have to, you know, you have to find blood, sweat and tears so how long do you have until the ASCO presentation? Like six days. How long do you sleep at night? Eight hours? Okay, two you're gonna eat. So you have 14 hours a day for the next six days to make it perfect. And I actually shared the room with, uh, with Francesco at ASCO. I could, have, I could have given that talk. For so many times that I've, that I've, that I've listened and, and, uh, and I've watched uh, Francesco in front of the mirror. 
Okay, MGH, 7 a.m., which is more or less 50% of our meetings were, were uh, uh, taking place with Jose because he was so busy and I wanted to talk to him and I didn't want to, I was demanding. I didn't want to be interrupted. And I came from a weekend that I was, that I spent in an emergency room in, 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 in Mass General. I was so sick. And I went there in, it was 7 a.m. It was a Tuesday. And you could feel that Jose was not in his best mood. And we started to talk together and he started to sort of criticizing every single thing. And then I stepped out and like, Jose, not this morning. It's not, I mean, not, not today. If you know, I'm just leaving and you know, we talk another time and he stopped for 10 seconds. And then we start laughing. Like, like crazy for a couple of minutes because you know we, we both knew there was tension, but it was nothing really. And basically he asked me uh, where I was going to watch uh, the Barcelona Football Club, uh, 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 his other uh, passion, uh, the, 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 the match that was going to be in, in the afternoon. And he actually cleared his agenda to come with me to the pub and watch that, uh, uh, that match. Not the only time I must say. Then what happened in Memorial? Memorial, you see it in the picture. Um, I said, Jose, I cannot meet with you today because my mom came, came, came over and I, I want to spend time with him, to, to, with her. So are you saying that your mother is in New York and you're not you know, uh, asking her to meet me or something? Well, or she would love to meet you, but you know, um, be prepared. I'm like, what do you mean? No, just be prepared. So he cleared his agenda and my mom came and you know, he was charming as usual. How are you? He even try some Italian words and everything. And my mother started to scold him. It's your fault if my kid came to US, uh, I will never forgive you. And, my, and, and Jose was looking at me like, whoa, that's a long time I have a mom scolding me about anything. So it was, we just laughed and, and stayed there um, an hour. And uh, so to conclude how I, I actually looked for words to describe what he wanted. So Jose was not okay in being happy or disappointed or um, excited. He wanted you to be as well. If he was sad, he needed to be sad. If he was excited, you needed to be excited. So I'm sorry. So, what, what was Jose? Well, it was a storm. Everywhere he went, it was like a storm. A few trees had fallen, but the blade of the midwheels were, oh God, they were running, they were, they were spinning. Thank you. My name is uh, Jean-Charles Soria. <clears throat> I met uh, Jose in 1996 at Desmo when he was just coming back from, from the United States. And I was there at Esmo very, very proud, um, uh, presenting my MD work on penile cancer. And I got an oral and I was very, very happy. And then Jose came to me in the corridor and told me, you seem not to be stupid. And your presentation was, Okay, but do you think you have done anything for the patients with penile cancer by just describing what's the optimal care? Don't you think you need to work on what are the roots of this disease? Have you tried to pull the blocks of these 300 patients that you publish and do some, some study to understand which genes with biomarkers are leading to this disease or are you just satisfied to say that on one side people can get surgery for their, their penile cancer or brachytherapy? Because if you are satisfied for that, I don't think we're gonna meet again. Wow, it was an opener of my heart, my eyes, my, my mind. Of course, his communicative energy, that deep passion for the patients, his clarity of thinking and the demanding attitude he had completely changed my trajectory. Um, Jose has been an inspiration in my life. 
during my entire career. I have had the privilege to be um, a friend of him. He has been my mentor. I think Jose is the father of precision medicine and biology driven trials. He has trained and touched hundreds of oncologists and scientists across the world. I have also the privilege in 2008 to work under Jose when he was the president of the European Society of Medical Oncology. And he asked me to join the executive committee of the society. And man, that was again another extraordinary experience. That society needed a very deep change. And when you saw the immensity of work to be done, only a man like Jose could have implemented and convinced the entire executive committee with different uh, people and different perspectives to work together with enthusiasm. As you can see here in the slide, he's taking each one of the future president and past president. And I can tell you when, when he started changing ESMO that these two people were very far from him, but his energy and patience got him to accept and build the most ambitious strategic plan the European Society of Medical Ecology has had. And I can tell you, ESMO was set on a trajectory of success because of the leadership and the vision of Jose. He refocused the society in uh, best practice, good meetings. He created clinical translational fellowships. He increased membership. It was an extraordinary experience. When I started doing phase one trials, Jose was very generous, provide to me great advice. But probably the most extraordinary moment in my professional life has been working for Jose in AstraZeneca when he took over the executive vice president position of R&D oncology. And um, it was really very demanding to be with Jose. And I was in Gaithersburg, close to Washington DC with Jose sitting two desks from me. So what you described Mauricio, that he is a storm I witnessed with my own eyes, but he transformed and created a completely new momentum. And I will remember this dinner we had one of uh, the nights in uh, Bethesda. And I asked him, Jose, why, why are you so hard on me? Because that night he was, you know, laughing and we were speaking Spanish and uh, um, having some jokes uh, about uh, Catholic priest because we shared the fact that we both love science and faith. And he told me, I'm always gonna be very hard on you, Jean-Charles, because you can do much more. And I think a lot of people um, misunderstood his demanding attitude. He was never demanding for the simple sake of perfection or to hurt others or to show others that he was smarter because he was smarter, but because he believed that we needed to deliver our very best for cancer patients. Cancer eradication was not a vague goal, but a, the focus of his entire life. Jose has this gift um, to uh, create situations that were very unexpected. In uh, 2015, um, he sent his daughter Clara to spend three months with us in the summer and work at Gustave Roussy. And I thought I was doing a favor to Jose, but he made one of the most extraordinary favors to me because Clara is such an exceptional person and we love her so much and she has teached so much to us and she's part of our family. Um, when I was kneeling on my knees during his funeral and feeling very sad and receiving the Eucharist, I heard Jose telling me, you see, I mean, it was an intuition. 
Jean-Charles, I told you to read the Cathedral del Mar in 2017. Do you understand why? And now what, once you stand up, I don't want more cries. I want you to understand that you need to deliver the vision. You are part of a family, the family of those who believe and who, those who fight and need to build things. Jose for me was like the sun, bringing so much light, warmth, and expansive perspective. But like the sun, sometimes being too close to it, men feeling dazzled by the light or getting some sunburn, but always for the good reasons. Now that this light is gone, I feel the darkness much more and realize how much I miss feeling the warmth of his mind and friendship. Thank you, Jean-Charles. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm, I'm Leon Platanias. Uh, I'm a physician scientist uh, and, and uh, do research in leukemia. And I'm the director of uh, the Lurie Cancer Center at Northwestern University in Chicago. I met Jose, I first met Jose 35 years ago. Uh, you heard from Anas, we were all uh, interns at uh, Kings County at the State University of New York in Brooklyn. And um, we, you know, he and I were Southern Europeans and we had some things in common. He was from Spain, uh, Catalonia, I was uh, from Greece. So we were friends. Uh, there is so much to say about Jose, but during his residency, he had a remarkable uh, uh, mentality, a remarkable attitude. Uh, unless you worked those days then, it's very hard to imagine what was going on uh, in Kings County those years. It was like a war zone. It was the peak of the AIDS epidemic. And uh, as interns and residents, we had in regular wards, not in units, intubated patients that we would take care of them. It was not unusual to have 10 patients like this intubated on a regular floor. So I remember when I will, we will switch seats and uh, I will sign on to Jose, he will come in and he will be smiling in a great mood. And I will be all, you know, after an exhausting shift, I will, I will be in a very bad mood myself but he will be in a great mood. And I will tell him, well, why are you in a great mood? What's, what's up? And Jose will say, why not? And I will think myself, what's, what's wrong with this? You know, uh, is that a Catalonian thing or something? But then it took me time later with uh, Jose's career to realize what that was. Jose will make very difficult things seem easy and will make them happen. And we've seen that later in his career over and over again. After uh, we finished uh, the residency, Jose went to Sloan Kettering. I went to Chicago, I was at the University of Chicago. And Jose would call me periodically and ask me uh, my advice about his next career steps. And the reason for that is that was that before my residency, I had been at NIH, I had published paper, so during the residency, I was considered the research guy, the guy who knew about research, and Jose will call me and ask my advice. So sometime during the first year of his fellowship at Sloan Kettering, uh, he sent me a note and he said, I want to talk, I'm trying to decide to which lab to go. And, and we had a call, he called me. And he asked me, you know, I'm debating whether to go to work with Dimitrovsky or with Mendelssohn. So I told him, of course, you have to go to work with Dimitrovsky. You have to go to do real science, uh, get grants, and uh, be a real physician scientist. So we, we, but then Jose told me, you know, Mendelssohn has this antibody, you know, this EGFR, you know, and I will have the opportunity to work on this. Of course, I told him the, I told him, oh, these things don't work. You know, you will waste your time. Uh, instead, you should go and do basic science. And um, thank God he didn't listen to me. He ended up doing <laughs> a little of both, actually. He ended up connecting with Dimitrovsky, but he spent most of his efforts with Mendelssohn. 
And I was so happy he didn't listen to me because you see what happened after that. The whole field of oncology was transformed because of this decision of Jose to start in that area. And I could have almost ruined it, but he was smart enough not to listen to me. Uh, after we finished, after, uh, you know, at the later point, uh, we kept in contact. Um, he was, um, you can see here, that's a picture where he was giving uh, our most important lecture in the breast cancer field in Chicago and uh, the Lean State Symposium. And that's uh, on the right corner, you see the same, it's at the same time after a few drinks. And um, Jose was also in our advisory board and when I became director, he, he was on our advisory board in the cancer center. And he was also, I had to ask him because, you know, he had become physician in, in chief at Sloan Kettering uh, and he was doing an amazing job. So I wanted to see how he had developed the network of clinical trials. So I brought twice, not once, but twice, the whole leadership of Northwestern, the president of the hospital, uh, the, all the key people, strategy people, and would spend days there and, we had some good time and we really learned a lot. And uh, I remember at the end of the second visit, uh, you know, we were about to leave. So I walked in his office and I told him, you know, Jose, you have done something amazing here. This is incredible. I don't know, uh, it is amazing. And he goes, come on, Platania, you know, if we survive Kings County, we can do anything. And that was exactly, uh, you know, a very accurate point. So I'm gonna stop here. I just wanna say that it was a true honor to know Jose and to call him uh, my friend. Jose was bigger than life. He was a true giant in oncology and his impact will last for decades to come. Thank you. Okay, David, do you wanna go next? Sure. Hi, my name is uh, David Hyman. Uh, I met Jose. Jose came to Memorial when I was a first year faculty member in obscurity, minding my own business. And about two weeks after Jose showed up at Sloan Kettering, I got a call, uh, a page, and I think a text message simultaneously telling me to come to Jose's office on the 20th floor of Memorial. I had no idea why, so I showed up and I walk in the office uh, and Jose says to me, uh, are you David Hyman? I said, yes, sir, I am. And he says, and I got here and I, I told my people that we have to start sequencing the tumors of every patient at the center. And I hear that the only protocol at the center to do that is one you wrote for 50 patients in the phase one unit. Is that true? And I said, yeah, I think that's true, Jose. And he said, I, and the other thing is, I'm the global lead of this study that's really important to me. And I asked who's the PI and uh, Memorial and it's you. And I said, I think that's true too. And, and he said, I've heard your name twice. We're gonna do a lot of work together. And what really transpired over the next six years was an unimaginable whirlwind for me personally. And um, Jose during that time taught me oncology. He taught me how to be a clinical trialist. Uh, he taught me how to interact productively with industry and laboratory scientists. And so I thought what I'd do in the next five minutes is just give you a couple of personal anecdotes that I think exemplify his character and his mentorship of me during that six year period. Um, the first one I think exemplifies how Jose contended with the details. And this is a lesson that I've taken with me throughout my career since. We were working on a phase one single arm clinical trial of a targeted therapy, and we had had some intermittent responses and some patients that were doing really well. And at the end, but, but you know, it was a mixed picture like a lot of these clinical trials. And at the end of the clinical trial, we had treated about 60 patients, and we were looking at the summary data provided by the company, and we couldn't decide whether it really was going to be a meaningful patient the therapy for patients. And the, the company was leaning towards not developing it further. And Jose said, I can't look at these Captain Meyer curves. I can't look at these summary tables. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to go away and I need you to come back with a slide, one slide for each patient. It's gonna have their total medical history on it, the response to every line of therapy, 
It's gonna have exactly what happened to them on the clinical trial. It's gonna have exactly what the adverse events were. I want one slide for every 60 patients. And then he took two and a half hours out of his day as physician in chief of Sloan Kettering. And he sat in his office with me and the company. And at the beginning of the time, he took a piece of paper and he drew a line down the center of the paper. On the left, he put the drug worked. On the right, he put the drug didn't work. And as he went through each case, he put a big check on the side of the paper that he thinks that patient's experience correlated to. And I'm very convinced that nobody at the company and nobody, certainly not myself, had put in the time to do that type of detailed analysis. And I think at the end of it, we had no question about whether there was a therapy there or not. Um, Jose always put in the work. Um, he invited me pretty early in my faculty time to present to the Board of Scientific Consultants at Sloan Kettering. I think there were something like seven Nobel laureates uh, on it at the time and several titans of industry. Um, this was a heavy lift for me in my career. And Jose said, you know, David, I'd like to meet with you at, at, at 8 a.m. in your office uh, on a Sunday before the presentation. You might ask why he wanted to meet in my office. Um, his office was on the 20th floor, like I mentioned, the Sloan Kettering. And they were installing an incredibly heavy piece of machinery on the roof right above his office. And there was a non-zero chance that the machinery would fall into his office. So his office was off limits that weekend. So he came into my office at 8.30 in the morning, drenched with sweat, having already played a full round of tennis, because of course. And we really went at it for two hours working on the slides. And he went to go get coffee. And I noticed that he didn't come back. So I went to look for him. And Jose was methodically looking around the office, going room to room, and had this confused look on his face. And I said, Jose, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? And he said, where is everybody? Uh, I said, Jose, it's, it's, it's now 11 a.m. on a Sunday. But he looked at me confused and that didn't seem to answer the question for him because he was there helping me with my presentation. Um, Jose was really a bold and fearless leader. Um, when he first joined AstraZeneca, I think it was the middle of January 2018, it wasn't but two months later that they announced this huge deal with Daiichi to um, co-develop what became in HER2, which is clearly an unbelievably important therapy for patients. And I met him about a month after the announcement at ACR, and I, I congratulated him and I said, Jose, this is going to, I actually think I said to him, Jose, if you do nothing more for AstraZeneca, you've already done enough. This is gonna transform the company. And he laughed and we spoke and he said, David, I'll tell you the truth. When I told Sylvia I was gonna do this, she screamed at me and she said, Jose, you haven't been through enough. You couldn't wait a couple of weeks to make a massive change to the company. Um, so I think that just tells you how there really was nothing that could keep his spirit down. Um, I think, you know, speaking personally in academia, you see mentors of all kinds. Um, one of the things that, that really shined through um, in, in Jose's mentorship was that he was able to achieve all that he was and give all that he did while being a credibly devoted father and husband. Um, I have spent very few, very little time actually with Jose's children, who I know we're honored to be with today, but I feel like I know each and every one of them. And at one time he came in brimming with joy and, and looked kind of prideful during a meeting and I said, Jose, what's going on? And he said, I was just asked to be on the board of my son's private school. It actually happened to be where I also sent my children. And uh, he was relating the story to me and he said that the, the headmaster of the school came up to him and said, Jose, we would love to have you, we'd be honored to have you on the board. You've done so much in your life. You bring so many unique experiences. Don't worry, we know you have no money. Um, so I thought that that was very fitting of a New York City private school. Um, I'll leave you with one final anecdote, um, which has gotten me thinking, you know, Jose would tell me many amazing stories. And one story he shared with me was, um, I won't mention the drug's name, but there was a company that had um, what, what turned out to be a very, a very important drug for patients. He wasn't at all involved in this development. And inexplicably, the company announced um, back in 2012 that it wasn't going to develop this drug any further. And it, it caused kind of a, an outrage in the field. And um, Jose told me that he had gotten on an airplane 
and flown six hours to meet with the new CEO of the company to change his decision. And I thought, well, this is a little bit of exaggeration from Jose. You know, even great men can do this. And many years later, I happen to have dinner with that CEO. And we're reminiscing about Jose. And he says, did I ever tell you the story about when Jose flew six hours to see me, got off the plane and started screaming at me that under no circumstances could I kill this drug? Um, and I owe that the decision to resume its development and all the patients has helped since to that interaction that I had with Jose. I figured that if he was so passionate about it and came just for that only reason, um, it must be worth developing. And I actually, what, the reason I like that story so much is that I think for people like Jose, you really can't even comprehend the magnitude of the influence they've had. I have, his name has never been associated with this drug and never will. And, and yet he, he influenced the field in ways that I think we'll never fully grasp. Um, it was a true honor to work with him, to um, learn from him, um, and I will miss him dearly. Thank you. All right, my name is Ross Levine. I'm a physician scientist at Sloan Kettering, uh, and uh, it's a privilege to be here uh, today with some people that knew Jose so well. I think of what words uh, to describe Jose, uh, and to me, it's the idea of thinking big, but delivering bigger. I met Jose when he was at MGH uh, later uh, than many of our friends who've known Jose an incredibly long time. And it actually was one night in Barcelona until 3 a.m. with Lou Cantley, Levi Garraway, Jeff Engelman, Neil Rosen, and myself, uh, which was the first time I met Jose. And I really got the chance to know him well here at MSK. And I was really privileged to have a chance to work with him and occasionally share a tennis match like what you heard about from uh, David before those apocryphal meetings. And I think about what he meant to each and every one of us. It, his vision, his leadership, and a word we haven't heard today, but I think has been exemplified in everybody, his motor, his drive, really inspired and catalyzed so many of us, including myself. The key to his success, and others have said this this week on social media, was an insatiable drive to do better and to do better for every single patient with cancer. His ability was not just to do that for himself, but for everybody around him. And the thing I remember really feeling when I was working with Jose and when there were opportunities to really try to do something new is that he would challenge us but he would also support us. And it was that combination of challenging and inspiring us, but providing what we needed to be successful is what made him unique and special. It was that drive that really inspired him and us, and then he gave us the tools to be successful. His legacy lives on at every level, the broader field, cancer biology, drug development, even outside of the cancer field, how drugs are proven brought to our patients. His countless colleagues and protégés who've learned so much from him, you've heard about them, today, and his patients who adored him. We are lucky individually if we have an impact on any one of those spheres, but he did it uh, in all three, and I think that really says it all. We send our heartfelt condolences to the Veselga family and to the broader academic and uh, drug and development and cancer biology family touched by Jose. His vision, his words, his support inspire me every day, and I will carry that forward everything I do. That is his legacy. And that is all of our challenge moving forward. We have to continue to rise to each moment and opportunity, inspire others to join us and expand our collective impact. If we can carry that forward, what he did, and carry that forward to someone who wasn't touched directly by Jose, will have done something unique and special, greater than each and every one of us. Thank you. Joseph? Hi, I'm Jose Tabernero. I'm the director of the Valdebron Institute of Oncology. And first of all, I want to say that, that Jose was an extraordinary person, impatient uh, for whatever he did, with an incomparable devotion to his profession, to his patients, to cancer research, and to, and to, and to his colleagues as well. But also he loved uh, with passion uh, his family, uh, his wife, Sylvia, his children, Mark, Clara, Alex, and Pepe, and the rest of the family but also his close friends and collaborators. I first met Jose when I was a student, completing my finals in medicine, and he was a resident in internal medicine at the Valdebron University Hospital. 
in Barcelona. And if you go to the next slide, actually, you can see a picture on the left uh, showing one dinner at the time that he was um, he was a resident in in Barcelona. But uh, um, Jose, from the from the early beginning uh, and from that very first moment I met him, I felt his passion for uh, medical research and his desire to understand the biological and the fundamentals uh, of the diseases. It was obviously a long time before uh, all the fundamental insights that we have had with uh, with the human uh, genome. And I believe that uh, this inheriting curiosity and belief in exploring uncharted ground set him apart for all uh, the medical trainees of that time and prompted him to train in other more academic environments. As you, as you know, he left to the United States to complete the residency in internal medicine first, and later on in medical oncology at Memorial Hospital uh, when uh, he was appointed uh, as associate physician after completing his residency. But Jose wanted to give back all his vision in cancer care and cancer research to his law. Barcelona. It's uh, the department at Valdebron. And this was from scratch, integrating and commencing professionals, uh, cancer patients, and at the same time trying to implement this new vision of cancer research. In parallel, I had done my residency in medical oncology in St. Paul's Hospital in Barcelona. Uh, and I had uh, actually at that time point a permanent position there. But I went to meet Jose, and I was very fortunate to join, Jose, to join Jose's team uh, back in 1997. And this was the best working opportunity of my life. He created at the Valdebron Institute of Oncology a truly comprehensive cancer center research. And he put Barcelona and Valdebron on the map of the best cancer centers um, in onco and, and, and centers in oncology research and among the most prestigious centers across the globe. Actually, his inspirational model was rapidly adopted by many other hospitals around the world. Also, at that time point, funding uh, um, in Barcelona especially was a challenge, and he created a charity foundation, FERO, to engage the civil society to promote and fund cancer research, and he extremely succeeded on this. I have many anecdotes of that time. I just want to make um, probably a couple of them uh, for the restriction of time. The first one is that when I arrived to Valdebron, uh, I asked for a computer and he asked me, what kind of computer do you want? And I said, I want a PC. And he, and he sent me, do you want a PC? So a PC is a computer that takes 40 seconds just to start running and having the screen in black. And then you had to write wine.exit and it takes another 40 seconds um, uh, to have uh, like a, a Windows um, uh, a screen. And, we, uh, and, and, and he said, time is precious, so you cannot have a, a PC. Well, so I went for a Mac, and, and I'm still a Mac consumer. The second one uh, was that uh, just uh, one month after arriving at Valdebron, I was offered to be the super investigator of a clinical trial with Cetuzumab, an EGFR, the EGFR inhibitor. Uh, at that time point, actually, uh, it was evaluated in all tumor types, including renal cell carcinoma. So uh, he told me, listen, we have to beat all the other centers uh, around the world. Um, uh, so I did my best. I went to see the, the urologist in my hospital and I asked for patients. And, and after one week, I didn't find any patient at all. So I told Jose, listen, I have not been able to find a patient uh, in the hospital. I said, in the hospital? So what's the matter with that? Have, why do you have not going around all the centers in Barcelona, but not only in Barcelona, the region, and even if possible in Spain, to talk with urologists to get patients for the trials, because uh, actually patients uh, with renal, advanced renal cell carcinoma at that time point didn't have any option at all. And, and for sure, uh, we have to see better opportunities for patients. I did that. I went around <laughs> um, in many centers um, in the region and also throughout the region. And after one week, uh, I was able to include uh, uh, 10 patients in the trial. And actually, uh, you know, at the end, we were the center that recruited more patients uh, in that particular trial. So if you go to the next slide, uh, actually, Jose, uh, the next one, please. Jose left Valdebron in 2010, and we made great fine uh, in the farewell party at the Barcelona Football Club Stadium. Uh, this was uh, his football team. Nevertheless, I have to say that Jose was always with us, supporting BHIO, the Valdebron Institute of Oncology and Ferro, growing more and more, and continuously guiding and mentoring us. 
My relationship with Jose was always exceptional as my mentor and as much love friend. The same rigor and tenacity that he demanded from himself, he expected respectfully from the others. And we know that uh, he could be demanding at times. Uh, this has been mentioned before, but this was simply a manifestation on how determined he was to speed everything cancer research, treatment, patient care, and transformation of the organizations to be more efficient and excellent. In every leadership position that Jose occupied, he simply gave unconditionally, and he was never afraid of anything, and he never gave up. I want to finish with a modern quote from a book of Gerald Dicker, The Enigma of Room 622. The author says, life is a novel with an ending we know. The most important thing then is not how the story ends, but how we fill the pages. Because life, like a novel, has to be an adventure. Jose ran all his life as a continuous adventure, bringing all us in the same novel with enthusiasm and passion for everything we do. Jose, you are a love, our friend, and you will never be forgotten. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Rick, I think you're next. Okay. Am I on mute? No. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, Jose was a really dear friend to me, a uh, treasured colleague. But most of all, I felt like he was just my fellow traveler. There's something so unique and special about a fellow traveler. And it captures so much about our friendship, but Jose himself, and as we keep hearing from everyone, his joyful of approach to life as an adventure. I first got to know Jose when I was NCI director in the 1990s. And to me, Jose very quickly became the oncologist who I most turned to about patients. I knew that I was always get the most thoughtful, most creative, most empathetic reaction. And over the decades, I always referred patients to him and he in turn would become instantly their hero. I knew that if I ever had the need for my own physician, it would be Jose, I would call. Actually, Barb Weber just sent me a note yesterday about Jose, and in it she said, he helped me with many breast cancer patients who are still immensely grateful for being treated like the most important person in the world by the most famous oncologist in the world. That's what it was always like with Jose. But this clinical mastery, you know, his role as the beautiful healer, was always balanced with a scientific mind whose curiosity about mechanism, whose desire to understand and explain why things worked and why they didn't work was really at the core of how we approached cancer and was at the core of our endless conversations over these past two and a half decades. Conversations that always had the same theme. It always moved from where we were to where we were going. This was Jose as the restless traveler in the world of cancer. What was next? Where were we going? His curiosity about where we could go, his fierce demands about where we must go, and his impatience about how fast we need to go. Jose was about movement, as you've heard from so many people, and we all moved with him. Uh, for me, however, traveling through all this with Jose was just fun. Jose sparkled, and to plot and plan and work with Jose was to feel that almost mischievous effervescence that he exuded. He brought a joy to all the many projects he and I did together. And everything with Jose felt as if it suddenly had momentum. You know, Jose did an extraordinary amount, as we've heard. He was, must have been incredibly busy, but I must say, he never felt that way. He always felt available. Uh, there was rarely a month that Jose wouldn't call me or I wouldn't call him. And the conversation when he would call me would always start, you must have a new project. What are you doing? How come you haven't called me about it? Whatever it is, I wanna be part of it. <laughs> Three summers ago, Jose joined me for a few days in Aspen where we walked and hiked and had dinners and drank wine. And we talked about what we were each excited about. One day we rode our bikes 15 miles up the mountain to some place called the Maroon Bells, a breathtaking ride through wilderness and beauty among the snow-capped peaks, the pyramids. Jose at that point stopped and looked and talked about his love that I'd heard many times before of his house in the Pyrenees. And, and I can't tell you how wonderful it felt in this awful time uh, that it was to this place surrounded by his family that he was able to return. Jose came to Aspen restless 
and to discuss his next steps. He said he was ready for something new. And as he was getting older, he was getting more impatient and more ambition. I remember him saying, and I had trouble not laughing, he wanted to do something that really had an impact, <laughs> as if he hadn't. He wanted to affect more lives of more people with cancer. He was wondering if it was time to leave academia, and what that might look like, and what it might feel like. As always, we talked about limits and boundaries and how freeing it felt to try new things. The move the next winter to AstraZeneca after almost daily phone calls, I think he was in the Pyrenees, that I talked to him every day about him making this decision. And it was such a wonderful match for Jose's energy, his scope, and his ability to think and act at scale. Look, for all of us, the memory of a dear friend is punctuated just by moments that capture in snippets both the pleasurable stories to tell and the stories that are gifts that friends give to one another and that are often just emblematic of who that person was. A couple of years ago, Jose and I were on a scientific advisory board meeting at a company I'd founded called Grail. And we were all looking at brand new clinical data suggesting that we might just have an assay that could distinguish early cancers that were lethal from cancers that were not destined to kill people. It was a great group with Bill Hyde, Charlie Swanton, Dennis Lowe, and others. And we just moved rapidly on to the next slide. And Jose stopped us and said, just stop. He said, Rick, go back. Let's just go back and we need to linger on that data. He said, this could change so much about how we think about cancer and how we approach patients with cancer and how we design clinical trials. Let's just take a moment to let this data sink in and that we're seeing something new, something important. We all paused and he added, let's just remember this moment. And he did, and we did. And this man of intensity and impatience saw that progress in science and medicine you know, is measured in discrete moments of clarity and discovery. And that those moments like uh, Cliff's Rioja <laughs> should be savored. Jose was lucky that he touched so many of these moments of change and that he loved the discovery, but loved even more changing the practice of medicine and the lives of our patients. And although it's been quoted many times, it fits Jose so well. I think of George Bernard Shaw's lines, paraphrased by the Kennedys, how some men see the world as it is and ask why, and others see as it might be and ask why not. That was Jose. And I'm incredibly grateful to have traveled part of his journey with him. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm the next one. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to celebrate Josep Baselga's life. Um, most of you know him as Jose, the closest ones know him as Pepe. Uh, he always asked me to uh, call him by, by his Catalan name, by Jose. So uh, that's uh, what they always done. Uh, and, and me come back. Uh, Jose was an inspiration of mine throughout my career. Um, he's a role model. Uh, he's a role model to so many of us uh, that, that we've been speaking today. But it also showed me how somebody from Barcelona can go out there and have an impact in the whole world in, in, in cancer research and taking care of patients. There's many coincidences in my life that follow Jose's life. Um, as Olalia said, uh, we're both the sons and grandsons of, uh, of physicians from Barcelona. We actually went to the same high school and middle school and high school, uh, Jesuitas de Sarria. It's a posh uh, Jesuit school in the uh, uh, north part of Barcelona. We spent our summers going to, the, to this little valley between Spain and, and France in the Pyrenees called La Sardinia, uh, hiking in the mountain. Uh, my, my family also has a, 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 a house there. It's just so many coincidences. He studied medicine in, uh, we studied medicine in Barcelona and then went on to the Val de Bron to do our residency. Uh, Val de Bron was a community hospital. Well, it was a huge uh, public hospital. There was no research there. And you heard how uh, Giuseppe just changed that place when he went back because he decided to go to the US in between and learn how to be a physician scientist, go to a lab, study biology, and then incorporate it into the treatment of patients. And that has been the secret sauce of what he's done all his career, to understand the problem and address it. And no matter how big it was, he would succeed, that we know if he would. So he's become the most famous physician scientist in the world over, over these years. Um, 
I'm six years younger than him, so I, I could observe from the distance and say, oh, well, that's a good path to follow. So I decided to go to the US and do a postdoc and then fellowship training. Um, in between, uh, Joseph was my boss for one week in January of 1996. That's when he had returned from Memorial Sloan Catering and was starting at Val de Bron, and I was leaving to go to UCLA. And anyone who knows Jose, you know that just one week working with Jose, it's enough to impact your life and it has continued to impact you on a, on a positive way. Uh, so I went to UCLA and then I, I was a postdoc. I, every summer I would go back to Spain and, and I would call the assistant of his assistant at Paul de Bron and say, could Jose have some time uh, for me to stop by and say hi and tell him come and do it. And he would actually make time and, and kept, him, uh, kept me in his office while he was changing that place and uh, having his big vision of what uh, an oncology institute should be. Um, but I do have proof that Giuseppe is not always right because on those visits, he would tease me and say, why, why are you wasting your time doing tum immunology? What, what is that? It will never work. Well, it actually, one of the few times that he was wrong, it actually worked and he's recognized it over the years and many of these last years, he, he would just tease me back and say, well, I, I wish I could study more, more immunology and, and, and applied it and, and, uh, and incorporated more. So, but despite this, uh, Joseph continued to be my inspiration. Um, I witnessed how he created things out of nothing, how he went to these institutions that had been there for hundreds of years and just changed them and just made these new plans and um, improve the care of patients. There was always the, the goal to do that. Um, he was elected president of the ACR, at the organization that I, that's where I would go with my poster. Well, first, actually, I have to go back because when I was a resident in Val de Bron, I would say, oh, I'm so happy I'm going to ask you. He said, no, no, well, you should be thinking about going to ACR too. You, you'll learn a lot there. So, okay, okay. I, all of that, I have no idea most of the time what those people are talking about, but you can uh, follow Jose and then learn that you can actually, if you go somewhere, you can learn how things work and be able to perform like the best. Uh, so he, he has he inspired so many things while at the ACR. He uh, opened the organization internationally. He had all these initiatives that were continuing now. Uh, he showed me that you can be a Catalan and, and go on to be elected to the National Academy of Medicine of the United States of America. There's a long way from being in Barcelona, going to Jesuit school there, and being able to be a, uh, to make it this big. Uh, this, um, it's, I, I don't know, it, there's so many things I want to thank to, uh, to Seth for his inspiration and support in my career. So it, I just want to not take too much more time and with, uh, Visco Barça, the Cancer and Partnership. Great. Yuri, it's your turn. Hi, I'm Jory Graham, and um, it's a great honor to be here among all of you scientists and also to be in the presence of the great Baselga family, um, all of the doctors Baselga and uh, the future Dr. Clara Baselga. And I'm very, very grateful to be invited to participate and share a few words on behalf of all of the patients that you have mentioned. Uh, everything you've said is true, but maybe I can offer a tiny perspective on behalf of, I don't know, thousands, hundreds of thousands. I don't know how many patients Jose impacted directly. I assume that he impacted tens of millions of people indirectly. First time I met Jose Baselga, I walked into a small cubicle in Mass General where he had been assigned to me because I had a diagnosis of cancer. And I walked in and this man looked at me and he said, I know you from the Spanish translations of your poems and I know what my job is. My job is to protect your mind. And I want you to explain to me, how do you write a poem? What part of your mind do you use? How does the imagination work? Because he was a great doctor. I knew immediately I wasn't in the presence, forgive me, of an American doctor. 
And he actually wanted an answer. We spent almost an hour discussing how my intuition worked, where the imagination came from. And then of course he gave me a, a battery of tests with doctors all over the country to figure out, you know, whether the parts of my brain that made poems were going to be impacted by the drugs that were going to be inflicted upon that part of my mind. I wrote a few words to describe the experience of what it was to be in the presence of that man. Anyone who has been diagnosed knows the feeling that they have been given a death sentence. Jose made you feel you had been given a new life, a new way to grasp what life was, a new way to be alive. He was, as legions of patients will tell you, a phenomenal, generous, brilliant, luminous, and caring physician. The stories of his ability to tailor make treatments, to think out of the box as an oncologist for each patient are also legion. But as the person to whom you asked to extend your life, give you years you might not have had, give you a chance to defeat the disease, even against bad odds, he gave you something else. It's hard to overstate this, but he had what his culture calls duende. And with the lightest touch, a question, an astounding way of listening into, as if into your soul, he gave you your life back, transformed. He woke you gently to your aliveness. But as is the way with Duende, he did this by taking your fear away and turning it to a kind of awe before the mystery of death and life. The word hope does not capture it. He did not traffic in hope, let alone false hope. He graced you with initiation. No one thinks a, can a diagnosis of cancer is a blessing, but Basalga made you feel grateful for an awakening into existence you might not have had were it not for this coming face to face with your mortality. Do not mistake me. He never spoke about any of these things in this way. He just had a gaze, a ferocious generosity, a way of treating you and your life, which made so many of us feel he was not only an angel, because he was so incredibly kind, but also a ferocious angelic visitation, because he gently dusted off your soul and hand it back to you, awake. He was not sentimental. He fought your cancer with all the tools he had, many of which he had invented or discovered or was in the process of discovering. But he also had an extraordinary humility before the mystery of the disease. And it was very much your cancer. He gave you that dignity. You were not diseased. You were in an encounter with disease. There is a big difference. He once showed me a snapshot of himself as a young man in Spain in a corrida with a bull. He was just in street clothes. He said to me, that bull, that is cancer. I'm going to defeat it. One must not forget that he was not just a Spaniard and came from a long tradition of great healers and physicians but he was a Catalonian. He was not an American doctor. There is a huge cultural difference. And I think much was lost in translation when it came to things outside of his work itself. Every young doctor who had him as a mentor talks with awe and astonishment about his intuition and his genius. I think of those ways he had of seeing into the invisible, whether it be into trial data where others could not see patterns that he could see or could not intuit things that had not yet 
appeared, or whether it was the invisible soul of a newly diagnosed patient sitting before him to whom he turned his entire soul to say, how can I help you? And you heard his questions as if from a spiritual force, as if for the first time, how can I help you? And you had to think hard, what is it I need help with? The medical part was easy. You were in the hands of the best oncologist on earth. But the other part of the question, what can I help you with? You took that home with you. To answer that, you had to ask yourself why you were alive. What for? What did being alive mean? Were you as alive as you might be if you listened to your wake up call? It was this quiet stone Jose tossed into your stream, disturbing your universe, saying, wake up, you are alive, live. Thank you. That was beautiful, Jury. Thank you very much. Moving on, I think, Susan, you're, you're next. Hi again, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. I was just saying, wow, Jerry, you have captured the man that we're all privileged to know so well. Um, thank you, and that's hard to follow. So um, I've known Jose for nearly 20 years. I first met him um, when I was uh, hoping to design a neoadjuvant study in breast cancer, uh, and I was working at Bristol Myers Squibb. And I went and I met with him and sat with him and sh shared some of the data that we had in the preclinical data for this particular compound and had the first of many what I call Baselga inquisitions <laughs> um, from which I learned a huge amount because it was always uh, a massive exchange of information and, and, and knowledge and I remember being so impressed not just with the scientific knowledge of this great man um, but his manner, you've heard it in many of the uh, testimonials so far, so gracious, so engaging, um, so demanding, <laughs> so insistent. Um, and you could not but be captivated. And I was. Um, my next memory is of a meeting that Bristol Myers Squibb used to uh, organise called the Freedom to Discover meeting. And there were many uh, scientific greats that have been the recipients of what was the, the Freedom to Discover grant. The great thing about this program was um, that it was modeled off the Keystone meetings and it was held in, um, in a uh, ski resort in, in Utah. So there was science uh, and there was also skiing. And what I remember is, and um, I hope Sylvia, you remember too, is that Sylvia and um, Jose took me down what was labeled as a triple black diamond because after all it's America and you have to exaggerate. Um, so it's a triple black diamond, narrow tree run um, that they took me down. And I just thought, oh God, what am I doing? Uh, <laughs> but I was told just to follow the back of the skis and turn where I turn. Um, and there was no choice, right? So um, I, I followed and I skied. I remember also watching how elegantly um, Sylvia uh, skied and thinking, how could I ever ski to that um, level? <laughs> Um, we got to the bottom, I had survived, um, and Jose had this massive grin on his face, is, which is an image I will carry with me forever. Um, and he had enjoyed not just the skiing, but scaring me to death uh, in the process of the skiing. Um, because, <laughs> because he got pleasure from that. He got pleasure from pushing people to their limit and beyond uh, and seeing them do things that they didn't believe were possible. Um, and, and that's how... It, my experience of Jose has been um, throughout my, my time. When I came to AstraZeneca in 2010 uh, from Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, I knew that we had a huge uh, effort to, um, to build up the organization and to get things through. And I asked Jose to be the chair of our scientific advisory board. And uh, he came and I was always, and you heard as well, he was able to distill advice down to the essence. And at the end of the meeting, which included discussion of a drug that you may now know is called Alaparib. Um, he, he turned to me and he said, Susan, you've got a great portfolio. 
you just need to get a couple of these drugs approved. <laughs> and I laughed at that point and said, oh, geez, thanks. <laughs> and how much do we pay you again for that? Wonderful piece of advice. Um, <laughs> anyway, of course, he didn't just tell me that I needed to get two drugs approved. He helped. Um, he helped. Because the story that David Hyman told you is the story of Alaparib. Um, Alaparib, which was at the end of 2011, um, being written off. Um, and there was some data from the, the phase two trial uh, there, which showed that a subgroup of those patients um, had really benefited. And we showed those data to Jose, that a scientific advisory board. And not just based on those, that experience, but based on all of the physician's experience with, uh, with Alaparib. That was the reason why he went and had the breakfast meeting with uh, another great man, Pascal Soria, who is our CEO, uh, and persuaded him and influenced him um, to make sure that he, uh, he, one of his first acts as CEO was to restore the um, uh, development of that drug. And again, Pascal, uh, when he said, you've got to move with this, looked me in the eye and said, now when I'm telling you, you've got to move, you've got to move. He'd clearly been lit by the fire that was Jose <laughs> uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, drove it forward. And in the two years that I've had the huge privilege of my life to work with uh, closely with Jose at AstraZeneca, he has, as he had transformed Valdebron and as he had transformed um, Massachusetts General and as he transformed um, Memorial, has had a massive transformative uh, force here at AstraZeneca. He told me early on, you need to build a cadre of leaders, not just followers. He had a famous moment at a, a meeting that he's created called the Oncology Forum AstraZeneca, where we were discussing a, a program and um, uh, a junior scientist was presenting um, a Western blot. And uh, she described um, some of the changes on that and then went on to the next slide. And he said, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, stop, stop, stop. You must respect the Western blot. <laughs> you must respect the Western blot. And, you know, people that that went down, you know, around that the meeting around the organization as like and one of those scary moments. But but you know, when he looks at the Western Blot, he hears the music. It's like it's like looking at the score of Beethoven's Fifth uh, Symphony. Some people can see the little black dots on the on on the on the score. He could hear the music in his head, and he knew what it meant, and he knew what the interpretation of it was. And that's a difference uh, in the caliber of the of the understanding. So. I just want to say thank you very much for having this. Thank you for reincarnating uh, the spirit of the man who've had huge privilege to know for nearly two decades and to work closely with. We owe him a huge debt. And what I promise you is that the vision of the better future for cancer patients is one that all of us that have worked with him will carry with us and we will continue to work to deliver. Thank you. Before we go to the next speaker, um, we will probably have a f uh, some time for a few additional speakers. So if you would like to speak, please raise your hand uh, from your screen. There's a raise hand button <laughs> and, um, and we can see how many of you guys uh, we, can, we can fit in. Uh, the next speaker, Chris, Christian, do you, do, you wanna, do you wanna go ahead? I'm gonna try to project your, your pictures. Thank, thanks, thanks, Jean. I, I'm Christian Massacesi. I'm leading uh, uh, in AstraZeneca, the late development on college organization. I know Jose since I joined Pharma. Uh, so speaking about 2006, I work with him at Novartis. I work with him uh, before and why a little bit I was a Pfizer and of course in AstraZeneca. In, in Novartis, uh, I was a young uh, medical oncologist that joined development organization. I was put in charge of uh, one of the largest programs in breast cancer at the time with Affinitor. And uh, I, I, I met Jose, I decided it was the right person to run the, 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 the most important pivotal trial. And uh, since that moment, uh, I realized uh, something that already some of you said. Jose was incredible in understanding if a drug was good or not. He had this uh, intuition 
and like Jory the, the, the described, that I probably I never I never seen anybody else that I met uh, uh, so far. He knew when a drug was good or what is not gonna be. And of course, the drug made it, was approved. He helped incredibly in steering the, 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 the trial, in steering the, the enrollment of the trial and, and bringing this to the patient uh, as soon as possible. The second moment, uh, uh, and that, that started our, our uh, being touched uh, and, and being closer uh, and every meeting multiple times a year and so on. And then we were uh, even closer. There was a moment uh, I, and then I spent, uh, you know, in our, in, our, in our profession, we moved uh, quite a little bit around. I was in Paris uh, since, uh, since a few years. It uh, was, a, was a good experience, but it was time for me to come in the US. And I asked him, I talked with him, what do you, what do you recommend me? Well, I, 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 is the right moment? I have family. Uh, my wife is French. And uh, I say, don't, don't think one moment. Go, come, come. Actually, was one of my reference letters in my O1 visa application, and uh, it was an incredible, other important impact uh, uh, that he had uh, in my life at, the, at that time. It was a kind for me it was a dream to come in US, and uh, and it was was incredibly uh, helpful to to have him supporting this. The last uh, and probably the, the the deepest moment I, I had the, the privilege to, to, to have was uh, when I joined AstraZeneca. And, uh, and actually here I want to share one, uh, one, one memory that was uh, why I joined AstraZeneca. He called me, I was a Pfizer, I was very happy, seriously, uh, working in New York City. Uh, we were set, it was just a year and a half that we, we are here, so setting the family, setting, setting the kids and everything. He called me, I want to talk to you. Uh, okay, uh, come. So we went into his apartment. We sit in his in his living room, and we start to talk. He explained to me his vision. He explained to me what uh, he wanted to do, and uh, took to me like Maurizio. Took to me thirty minutes to be full in. I mean, uh, the guy has the 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 the, the capability of uh, thinking clear see ahead and bringing into with, with him that uh, i i had many mentors many guides and managers in my some of them incredibly good but nobody was uh, was visionary uh, uh, like, like, like jose was so i joined astrazeneca and uh, in astrazeneca i discovered the manager i discovered uh first of all i i I couldn't even believe that Jose was uh, in pharma since only one year. He looked like a veteran. Uh, uh, the learning agility that he had in, in, in completely absorbing the, the, the new environment and, and then play was, was, uh, was unique. But the other, what, what, what uh, uh, then I discovered was uh, how good he was to bring you to the next level. And again, uh, he was pushy. It was incredibly demanding and pushy. But uh, if I look at what uh, I personally, what as an organization we achieved uh, in one year, uh, in one year and a half that we worked together, I, I never did before in my career. And probably in another organization would have taken two years, three years. So it was able really to bring the, you to the next level, to the next, uh, uh, beyond your, what, what, what you, you, you you think you could do. And actually, this was probably secret. I, I talked to him several times uh, in, in a in more relaxed situation. I say, what is your secret? Why, why you, you, you went through several places in your, in your life and you transformed them? Uh, you had this one success after the other. What is your secret? He told me, my secret is people. You need to find, hire, and develop the best people. This is the only way for you to succeed. And this is, was uh, really an open eye for me. Uh, uh, and this is what uh, is one of the legacy that I, I took really strong commitment to continue to, to bring ahead and to do. Another, another important moment, another memory I want to share with you was uh, a link to this, was uh, uh, August 2020. We opened up 
New York office. The view that you see, the, my background is the view from the cafeteria that we have from that office. Because I wanted very, very, very hardly this, this office. Uh, and that day where himself, myself, and the, the, the guy, Keith, that is the, the manager of the site, of course, we were after the first pandemic uh, uh, wave. Uh, and that was uh, uh, a moment in which uh, after many months that we are working uh, in this way, we were able to take meetings from the, the same room. And uh, without anything pre-planned, after between one meeting and another, we were able to spend uh, uh, 30, 30 minutes, 45 minutes in front of whiteboard and, and discussing and uh, going into problems, into things. And, and after these 30 minutes, we watched each other in the eyes. Uh, and I, I really, there was one of those magic moments in which you really feel a contact, the human contact with the, with the person that is in front of you because uh, it was a moment and we said uh, it, it, it's unbelievable how beautiful it is to be together and discussing together and get things done in this way instead of that through this computer so i really uh, another another time experience uh, the, the the human side of us uh, i really enjoyed to be with people uh, uh, yeah, me. With people you're unmuted. You're unmuted. so i I uh, uh, I will miss Jose, like everybody of you, very, very, very much. Uh, I will miss uh, his uh, text during meeting, <laughs> during uh, 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 governance. I I will miss uh, him teasing me because I'm a Juventus Turin fan. Uh, when we're gonna fail for uh, next time in uh, in European competition. I will miss him telling me that, uh, uh, in challenging me when uh, I, 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 everything seems to be done and he was coming with the next question and challenge this. So I will miss his passion. I really will miss his passion. And his passion for patients. What uh, I, I, I really was very touched by the Yori, uh, Jory uh, uh, words because this is uh, what Jose was. Jose was uh, doing things keeping the patients always in his mind as a first thing. And this is, I think, what he, he delivered in our organization. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is what we will, uh, we will bring uh, uh, ahead. He shaped uh, AstraZeneca Oncology in a way that now we will go. And I know that if we deliver uh, what he started, uh, I, I, will make him, I will make him happy. And this gave me, gave me uh, serenity. This makes me feel well. Uh, because uh, this is something that uh, I can I can probably help to do, and uh, this is something that uh, uh, I will do in his honor. Great, Christian. We go to Carlos. Carlos, sorry for sk skipping you out of the order. Um, please go ahead. Um, uh, thank you. It's good to see you all. I I met Jose at an ACR meeting in San Francisco a long time ago. Uh, he was a resident in medicine and I was a medical oncology fellow. I remember to this day it being, uh, I'd say the, the manly equivalent of love at first sight. Uh, after going over the poster he was presenting, we started talking about our love of medicine, the promise of cancer research and many similar aspects of our upbringing and what brought us to this country for our postgraduate training. He came from Spain, I came from Ecuador, and for the next 30 years after that, any time I talked to him or I saw him was a very special moment for me, and I mean that. Now, there are many inspirational experiences I, I owe to him, but uh, let me share with you how Jose impacted me, and let me celebrate that. Uh, it was in many ways, but perhaps the two main ones were first with the enormous generosity of his time, intellect, and spirit. Whenever I face challenges in career and leadership, I always called him first, and he was always there giving the best advice. Whenever something special happened in my career, he was the first one to call me or drop me a note to congratulate me and wish me well. And, and what was really special is that he was so genuinely happy about it. Now, the second aspect that impacted me was that friendly 
but fierce competition that always brought to me. That competition that stimulates our drive uh, to reach for the stars on behalf of patients with cancer is something he epitomized, something that li I'd like to celebrate, something that really helped me and something that I will sorely miss. So Sylvia, Mark, Alex, Clara, Pepito and Lali, you have a great husband, father and brother. Even though his physical body is not with us, please know that the many colleagues, myself included, who were so fortunate for Jose to impact their careers will ensure his lessons and legacy will never die. God bless you all and que Dios los bendiga. Thank you, Carlos. We, we want to switch it up back to a patient, a uh, former patient again. Um, we have Sadie Meyer. Uh, Sadie, do you want to speak now? Can you unmute? Can just un unmute. You, yep, we hear you now. Is that okay? My condolences to renowned Dr. Jose Basaga and family. I am heartbroken. I'm a former patient of Dr. Basaga, a five times breast cancer survivor since 1994. He has prolonged millions of lives. I was his patient in Boston, Massachusetts, and I followed him to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where I received my treatments. I first met Dr. Jose Basaga at the Breast Cancer Symposium luncheon in 2009 in New York. At that time, in 2009, I was diagnosed for the third time with metastatic breast cancer. He was the guest speaker for metastatic breast cancer for her to targeted therapy. He inspired me. I felt there was still hope. I thought I was gonna die that week or so. It was incredible. When I traveled to Barcelona, Spain on leisure, he assured me there was a hospital, Valdi Herbron, which he formed. I was doing very well while I was in Barcelona. I did not need to go to a hospital. I enjoyed Barcelona. When he was honored in Israel at the Weizmann Institute in 2017, I flew from New York to honor him. This was only three weeks after I was in remission for the fourth time diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. With her too, he was shocked to see me. He was so pleased I was doing well. I was under his care in New York. I, and I still am on the same therapy he treated me at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center when he left. I wish I could have told him that. I was under his care in New York and I was and I'm still on his targeted therapy. He and it has impacted my life in so many ways. As a patient when diagnosed with cancer, you did not feel cancer was a death sentence. Rather, it was the rebirth. He inspired my life. He was caring, humble. His humor relaxed patients while he was serious at the same time dealing with your cancer. Through his lifestyle, he has instilled no fear of cancer to his patients. One day I asked about skiing, if I can get back on the slopes. He was a black diamond helicopter skier in Switzerland. He energized me. He totally amazed me in every which way. He instilled no fear in me when dealing with cancer. He reassured me I would be okay. He transformed me and mo at the most difficult situations into hope and reassured there was options when being dealt with other drugs to survive. <laughs> Dr. Jose Bazago's legacy will always be remembered by many women and men that have been touched and affected by cancer. His legacy will never leave us. We must continue to cure and extend lives to patients with metastatic cancer, brain cancer as well, dementia, Alzheimer's, and the disease that took his own life, that affected his own brain. Such a 
brilliant doctor in so many ways, we must continue to have Dr. Pasaji as our leading force. His spirit will never leave us. To find cures, we must never give up hope. Thank you for the time in understanding the life of a cancer patient, what it means to them to have a doctor and a team by their side. Thank you. That was uh, Margaret. You're you're next. Uh, I can you unmute Mar Margaret? Sorry, I have. Thank you. Uh, I I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words, um, even though it's a late hour. Um, since Jose was a very close friend and colleague of mine, um, this past week, uh, since we heard of his untimely death, um, has been really shocking to everyone uh, at the loss of this amazing scientist and, and friend. And, uh, and it's been extraordinary to see the outpouring of, of amazing calls and, and texts and, and emails from people around the world expressing their sadness at, at his, the loss of, his, of the great Jose. At the ACR, um, Jose was a major force, uh, filling many different leadership roles um, he was, of course, on many committees, culminating in his service on the board and uh, as president in 2015-2016. Uh, he was very proud of being, having been elected president. And, and during his um, presidency, he contributed greatly to, uh, to our programs, both nationally and internationally. I think uh, it's fair to say that ACR really benefited from his brilliance and his innovation, passion for his work. Uh, I wanted to um, say as one example, uh, he guided our Vision 2020 strategic plan, uh, which was just fantastic the way he handled it. In fact, he took it over. He was discussing with the consultant and literally took over the, the, uh, the planning of, the, uh, of this event when, when we were to really devise our future um, scientific programs. And, and uh, what was really came out of this was his love for uh, basic science and his contribution to patient care. And, um, and so during this exercise, you know, he conceptualized the role of cancer science as, as starting from not only uh, basic cancer research, but even prior to basic cancer research, uh, uh, broad -based basic research, all the way to clinical practice, which was very surprising to those of us in, in AACR who who never thought that we would be expected to really interact um, on a regular basis with uh, a practicing oncologists. We really credit him for his uh, vision of bringing practice uh, changing clinical trials to the AACR. As has been mentioned, you know, he, he loved to push people uh, when he thought uh, this would be helpful to a goal. And, um, and so he told me one time, and it was back in 2006, 2007, that the ACR annual meeting would never attract clinical trials, uh, knowing that this would be the way to make me work harder to make it happen. And of course, when uh, when he realized that it was working, and um, and of course at the time we were getting less than 10 trials, and now we get over 200 trials that are quite remarkable. He smiled and and then asked me about my next goal, which was also characteristic of him. So we're now grieving the loss of our dear friend and colleague, and um, I'm always going to remember him for his uh, tremendous intellect, but for his kindness to me, you know, he worked, we worked together for almost 20 years, uh, for his engaging personality and his inspirational, his inspirational personality. And in his name, I want to say that I and my colleagues at ACR will work even harder to honor his memory like all of you, I'm devastated at, at the loss of Jose, and I will miss him forever. Thank you. Uh, next, Levi, do you want to speak? I thank you for giving me the chance to speak, and I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, you know, so we, I, I first had a chance to meet with Jose shortly before he came to Mass General, uh, and. I remember when he came to Mass General, I was at the Dana-Farber at the time. And of course, he did great things. It was great for Mass General that he he spent time there. It was also great, I think, for the Dana-Farber that he spent time there, maybe for different reasons. And those reasons were when he got to Mass General, 
the place started to move and shake a little bit. And they were starting to pull some things off in terms of the kinds of studies that they were doing and the impact they were having that, frankly, we hadn't done at the Dana-Farber. And uh, it started to cause some shaking in the boots a little bit and some consternation. But but that was a great thing because uh, it was it allowed for uh, a bit of a wake-up call. Say, hey, guys, we've got to step it up because uh, <laughs> we're starting to look bad. So that it was a it was a remarkable impact, uh, as we've heard, uh, that he had not just at the institutions that he uh, that he was at, but also just the ripple effect of what of what's possible uh, as a result of of his his thinking and uh, his his uh, very high standards for what, what was needed. And a couple of points that I, that I won't spend a lot of time on because they've already been uh, touched. But then there's one anecdote that I do want to make sure gets uh, brought into his memory that's a little bit different. So the the two that have been touched on are the the fact that the your interactions with Jose they always felt like they were the most important to him. And uh, Rick mentioned this, it, he always felt available, whether or not, maybe whether we were going to an ACR meeting or uh, a, a Board of Scientific Councils meeting at Memorial or, or wh whatever it was, I, I felt like I don't need to make an appointment to meet with Jose. He's gonna, he's gonna be available, we're gonna have time. And he, he would just, in those moments, uh, which were over dinner or extended times, he was always happy to share his, experiences and and uh, anecdotes and just perspectives with you he, he welcomed the opportunity and, and it was always edifying and enriching and also funny I mean I, it, he, he would just have these anecdotes and see the irony and things and and it was just a lot of fun so that so the connection uh, was a big was a big part of it the other uh, point that has already been mentioned is his the sense of with Jose there was nothing that couldn't be done. I mean, there were, whether it was projects that we were working on or having a chance to uh, at one point work on co-founding a company, I mean, there would be things that we'd be thinking about where you would step back and say, wait, this is totally amazing. But then you might also think, but it's a little insane too. Can we really pull this off? And with Jose, it would be like, he, he was very realistic. He said, well, you know, in this situation, it might be tough, but we might be able to do it over here. Uh, and so he was always with him, there, it was always possible. And so, so there's this magnetized a sense of we can do great things for patients uh and and there, there wasn't a there wasn't a constraint it was hey let, let's think about how we could do it let's not get hung up with where it's hard let's think about how we could do it and that was always uh really inspiring uh but the third anecdote uh which is something that uh that uh i'll always remember uh and is a little bit different uh it, it came when so jose and i had a we were working on a project together and some data was starting to emerge and things were starting to get excited. And I happened to be at Memorial uh, for a BSC meeting and we were talking about it and we said, hey, let's get together and discuss this. And so, okay, it'll be 6.45 in the morning in his office because there's meetings, uh, full day meetings. So I get to his, I, I go into the building where his office is and I'm heading to the elevator and a security guard, you know, sir, do you have an idea? I said, actually, no, I'm, I'm just heading up to see Dr. Bazelga. And of course, you know, he's physician in chief of Memorial Silicon. You're here to see Dr. Bissell. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I am. Do you have an appointment? Uh, well, actually, no, I, I don't have an appointment. And so I, I realized, okay, there's a problem here. So I call Jose, I said, Jose, I can't get up. Uh, I can't get up to see you. Okay, I'll, I'm coming down. And so while uh, we're waiting for Jose to come down, I'm looking at the security guard who, uh, who like me, happens to be African-American. I'm like, come on, you don't think I could have an appointment with Jose? And he's just you know, staring at me sternly. And then Jose gets down and, you know, the first interaction is not with me, it's with the security guard. And he's smiling and he knows his name and he knows his family. And the security guard lights up and it's like, okay, everything is all right. But but for me, that encounter, that told me everything I needed to know about Jose. Because, you know, sometimes as we all know, we can overlook people who don't have posh offices or big fancy titles. Uh, but that one, clearly Jose was as connected to that security guard as he was to anybody else that you might meet in the hospital. So that was I, that was something that I will always remember uh, about Jose. <clears throat> and so uh, I, I guess I'll stop by, you know, I was really moved by so many testimonies, including uh, Jean-Charles testimony. And, you know, it, it sort of brought this uh, image of now, maybe I'll, I'll think about Jose uh, in the future. And that image is for many of you who have spent time in Barcelona, you know, everyone has probably visited the Sagrada Familia. And the Sagrada Familia is kind of an interesting analogy to Jose. It's towering, 
It's singularly inspirational and tragically still unfinished. And, you know, I, I feel like right in this moment, it, it feels like Jose's life, it was great, but it, it was somehow tragically unfinished. But the, the finishing, just like with the Sagrada Familia, the, the finishing, it depends on others. It depends on those who, uh, you know, who have been inspired and galvanized by that vision uh, and have had the flames of inspiration inspired by uh, our interactions with Jose. And so it's up to us to finish that work, uh, remembering Jose fondly uh, and remembering him with gratitude uh, for the chance to have it, for having been close to him for a part of his journey. So thanks for giving me a chance to share. Thank you very much, Levi, that was great. Uh, next, uh, Stephen. Hi, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I want to be very brief because everyone has said such incredibly accurate things about Jose. I just want to remember Jose with, by, by two, two memories, and I'll be brief. Uh, I, I'm a medical oncologist, and I've been working in industry for, for 30 years before I retired uh, two years ago. But my first encounter with Jose was working on and leading the, pro, the clinical development program for ZD 1839, which many of you may remember is Drifitinib, also known as Aressa. And I had traveled to Valdebron, knowing that Jose was the leader in the EGFR field and, and wanting to collaborate with him and, and, and get his insights. And I have a vivid memory of sitting in his laboratory with him and his broad multidisciplinary team of pathologists, pharmacologists, biologists, chemists, others that he had built up at Feldebron and as a world leading uh, center at the time. And we were just brainstorming. How can we best demonstrate uh, scientifically what this drug is doing in humans? And to make a long story short, you know, it, it, it culminated in a translational research project demonstrating the pharmacodynamic effects of gefitinib in human skin and demonstrating the inhibition of phosphorylation of the EGFR receptor. But it was a seminal paper in demonstration of target engagement. But for me and the rest of my career, it was an illustration of how translational research leads to good drug development. And it was something that I carried with me for the rest of my career and helped to influence it at three major pharmaceutical companies, that spirit, that scientific rigor, uh, that collegiality of approach uh, with a multidisciplinary team was all instilled. Uh, and Levi just said it nicely, galvanized by, by Jose's vision and, and who he was. The second memory was a little bit more personal. I had uh, just recently come from a sudden transition uh, at, uh, at one of the companies that I was work working at and uh, suddenly left that company. Uh, the very first phone call I received from anyone once the word got out was from Jose from Spain. His very first question to me was, Steve, are you okay? and telling him that I was and everything was fine. The second question was, I had just uh, initiated a collaboration with Jose with that company. And he wanted to know whether he should still continue the collaboration because it was based on our relationship. And I said, Jose, it's not about me. It's about the science, it's about the drug, it's about getting more therapies out to patients. We had a great discussion. And he went on and, and, and fulfilled uh, that collaboration and it led to, led to really uh, great things. But it just signifies not only all the great things that, that people have said about Jose, his science, his fortitude, his inspiration, but it also speaks to his humanity and his, his concern for others, whether they be colleagues, patients, family, friends. And that's the memory of Jose I'll cherish the most. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. 
Thank you, Stephen. So uh, I, I think we're only just, we're about half an hour over, but uh, in, overall, um, but I, I think the family really enjoys the, these memories. And I think that that's what the, you know, Jose would have loved to hear all of his friends and colleagues speak. So I'm going to pick uh, three more and then I think we'll, we'll have the family uh, closing. Um, please, if you can keep it, uh, um, you know, within a few minutes, that'd be great. Uh, Peru, you're next, then uh, Hua, there's a Hua and then Bob. Um, hello. Um, good evening to all of you. I'm Pidu Cantare, director of the Fedo Foundation. Um, the foundation was founded by Dr. Baselga in 2001 in Barcelona. Um, I joined the foundation in 2008. I was coming from a completely different world. I was coming from the art world, had nothing mm, to do about medicine, um, knew nothing about oncology, but I had heard about Dr. Baselga. I knew who he was. Um, when he interviewed me, I was immediately, immediately um, convinced uh, by his project, by what he told me, how it was going to be. Um, he wanted to join the, um, the whole community in, not only in Barcelona, but in Spain, so that everyone would help and uh, help to fund cancer research. Um, he was, um, he, he knew I liked football at that time. So he said, listen, Piro, um, just to make sure you understand what this is about, I am not playing in the Spanish um, local football league. I'm playing in the champions. This is Europe, this is the world. So this is huge, this is big. I said, yes, I understand. I'm in, I'm in. I was impressed by Pepe Baselga the same minute I met him. And I have tried during all these years to do um, what he wanted to do. I think we're almost there. He always said he wanted Fundación Fero to be the leading uh, foundation in Spain in oncology. Um, I think we're there um, and I want to thank him I want to thank him in the name of the president of the foundation, um, our dear um, Sol Laurella, and, and on behalf of all the board of the Fedo Foundation. We will follow his legacy. We will even work harder if we can. And I want to thank the whole Baselga family. I want to thank Silvia, um, she always, she was confident in me since the beginning. And I'm really impressed with his four children, with uh, Mark, um, who was actually the only one I knew. He was a friend of my daughter, um, Clara, Alex, and Pepito, which I, I had heard about, about him a lot. Um, thank you very much for um, all of you being here, being part of this, of this tribute to Dr. Baselga, we will miss him. And um, hello from Barcelona, you're all invited to come and see what we're doing. Please come, um, we will be very, very honored to see you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peru. Joaquim, did I pronounce it right? Uh, yeah, it's Joaquin Belmont, uh, I'm, I'm Catalan too. So I, I'm, I'm also a colleague of, uh, of Tony Rivas and Coseta Bernero. Um, what can I say about uh, uh, Jose Pepe uh, is that we grew up uh, together. Um, we started meeting at the military service and some, uh, not, not a lot of people know about that. He went to Melilla. Uh, we, we grew up like a soldier, small soldiers there. Uh, I went to Almeria and then uh, finally we met together uh, when uh, looking for the position as uh, the fellowship and we both together start in Valdebron. He started internal medicine, I started oncology, but his like a, a willingness to, to improve, make him to move after two years of internal medicine to, uh, to uh, Brooklyn and then become a, a fellow. And I stayed there at Valdebron when after 10 years, he returned being my boss. And what can I, I, I said uh, is he taught us uh, 
what oncology is nowadays in, in Barcelona and in Valdebron and, and in Spain. So he taught uh, excellence on, on managing patients, respect to patients, research, clinical trials. We learn a lot. So and then he finally decided to move uh, to Mass General. And again, I, I went to see him and visit him. I was uh, uh, 50 years old at that time. And uh, he said, what are you doing uh, still in Barcelona? You need to come to here to the US. And he pushed me to take the steps and then to move to Dana-Farber. I took a position at, at Dana-Farber. And then this is why I'm now based in the, in the US. So what can I say about Pepe? He has been a role model, has been a, a guidance for a lot of oncologies. Uh, I, it has been a, a role model for me. I cannot been able to follow him. So it has been a difficult to follow because he was so demanding, so pushy, as has been mentioned here. He was extremely intolerant to mediocrity, and this has made create a big oncologist and uh, Jan Charles Soria uh, was mentioning that. Um, also, I think that the, the, the analogy that, that has been made that this is like uh, that Levi mentioned, Sagrada Familia, that's a reality. So his legacy will remain and uh, likely more people will need uh, uh, to learn on uh, what he has uh, left behind. Um, I, want, I want to send uh, my, my personal condolence to, to Sylvia and the family. Okay, it has been a, a great loss. Sorry. Thank you very much. Bob? You're on mute, Bob. Your, your, your AirPods are not working. Okay, is this, is this better? Yep, we can hear you. Thank now. you. Thank you for the opportunity. So I got to know Jose in 2014 when I uh, came to Memorial Sloan Catering as the uh, International Oncology Fellow from Australia. Uh, at the time, I had a, a great uh, life plan uh, to brush up my CV with the Memorial Fellowship, then uh, learn as much as possible, come back to Australia and, and have a nice academic life. I actually bought a house close to the beach, got my in-laws to uh, have babysitting plans and everything. But Jose had completely uh, changed that. He's been such a life changing inspiration, uh, got rid of those plans in me. And I'm still here today, seven years on, uh, still working hard as a, uh, a physician scientist and, and clinical trial investigator. Jose is the epitome of physician scientist. Uh, I recall uh, in a meeting, uh, in a lab meeting where I uh, said I'm more of a clinician than a scientist. He, he then scolded at me uh, in the meeting uh, and tell me never ever say that again, you are a physician a scientist. He proceeded to teach me how, how a privileged position that is, how, how powerful that position may be. A, a physician can bring those questions to the lab uh, to answer these questions and then go back to the clinic and, and to design life-changing clinical trials, practice-changing trials. And he uh, had, had even taught me to be a world-class clinical trial investigator. He said, you've got to be like a hunter. And in those passionate uh, uh, mentorship discussions, he would grind his teeth as if you're going to be like a wolf and go after your prey, uh, go after the very best in, in the uh, clinical science. Uh, and he would say that uh, to be a hunter, uh, hunters uh, travel light. And, and so therefore, get rid of all your useless projects uh, that are not practice changing. Uh, so he would pu push me and push me beyond the limits. And, and still to this day, that, that spirit lives in me. And I just wanted to say uh, that the, 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 the Jose's legacy and influence, uh, it carries on uh, and it, it will carry on for a very, very long time uh, for the benefit of so many people. And if all of us have that the Selga spirit, just a little bit of that the Selga spirit in us, I think the world will be in a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. One last uh, speaker before we go to the family. Is it Yuan? Did I pronounce it right? You're on mute. Yes, Yuan uh, Sewane. I am uh, uh, from Barcelona. I am in the Valdebron Institute of Oncology. Uh, in fact, I, I, I cannot say too much. I, I have no words because I've been in shock for, for all this week. Uh, I, I remember him a lot. I will miss him a lot. I just want to say, say that I remember being in New York. I was in Memorial Sloan Catering 
cancer center for six years. I didn't know what to do. I, I was thinking to stay there in the, in the US or come back to Barcelona since I am from Barcelona. And I remember that I contacted him in a meeting and then he called me and, and he was fantastic. He really showed me his vision of what he wanted to do in, in, in Val de Bron. And he, as, as Mauri said, in, in a couple of minutes, he, he really engaged me in that, in that vision. Uh, he was a fantastic uh, mentor. Uh, he was also a fantastic person. And, and I had the, the privilege to, to collaborate with him for all these years, because even when he was in, in, in the US, we were able to collaborate and, and do fantastic things. And I always, uh, remember this, think big, Joan, think big, uh, the sky is the limit. And this is something I want to, to remember. And, and I also want to thank him for, for all his help during all these years. And I want to bring my condolence to, to the family and I'm broken. And thank you very much. Thank you. Clara, Alex, or anyone from family want to go? Yeah, perfect. Um, we would just want to start with uh, giving them some thanks for this amazing event. Um, so, Jing, thank you so much for organizing this whole event, for bringing it together, um, for making it possible. So thank you so much. Um, then we want to thank Chris and AC for providing the technical support and making the uh, virtual event possible. Um, and then to everyone who spoke and kind of shared their memories, it was so beautiful. And thank you for this tribute and for, you know, providing this new perspective and providing a lot of new stories that I didn't know and that I'm sure that a lot of my family didn't know. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to my older brother who wants to share some memories. Hi everyone, uh, this is Mark, Jose's oldest son. First, I also wanted to give uh, a shout out to my brother, Alex. He's worked very closely with Jing to reach out to everyone and make this event also special. So thank you, Alex. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna keep this very brief, but yeah, throughout the years, um, my dad has taught me many lessons, but I think today there's one that stands out from the rest, which is surround yourself with brilliant people and never stop learning. I remember very vividly like five years ago when I finished college and I was evaluating different jobs, uh, he gave me one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever received, which was Mark, you know, the most important thing is to go to the company that has the brightest minds, smart coworkers, smart bosses, uh, who are not afraid to question you. Um, and this will make your job, um, your, your daily job, a challenge. But what it will give you in return is priceless. It will help you learn faster and be the best version of yourselves. Um, and it will motivate you to think bigger and have higher expectations. And uh, for, for those who, who know my dad very well, uh, you know, my dad was never afraid to surround himself with, with brilliant people who questioned his opinions, plans, or beliefs. Um, and not only he was not afraid, but he also encouraged people to, do, to challenge his points of views. Um, and today, it's just so great to, to meet and hear from a lot of those brilliant people that, that supported him in, in the past, in this past 30 years of his professional career. So yeah, thank you all for, for sharing these beautiful and remarkable memories that as my brother said, I, were, some of them were, were new to us. Um, so, so thank you again uh, to all of you. Uh, and now I'm gonna pass it to, to my sister, Clara. Good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wasn't gonna say much today except thank you. Uh, thank you to Jing and my dear little brother, Alex, who helped organize this beautiful event. But now after having heard you all speak, I'm, I'm moved to say thank you, not just to Jing and Alex, but, but to all of you for being here and giving us a little bit more of our father when we, we felt he left too early. Um, you know, my seven college roommates who are also my best friends used to tell me I was crazy uh, because I used to wake up every morning in college at 5.30 a.m. just like my father and work in the dining hall before the university woke up. Um, I'd work for an hour or so, and then I'd call him around 6.30 uh, to debrief the day ahead. And we'd talk organic chemistry and essays. Uh, we'd talk meetings with my professors, and he'd tell me about the day ahead. Um, I'd plead him to please be nice to whoever was presenting that day, that that was you know, useless most of the times. Um, 
sometimes he'd email back he'd email me back an essay that I worked on for weeks and it was always covered in red top to bottom he said the ideas are here but then everything was totally changed totally different um and and you know on those mornings we like to make big deals of whatever was ahead no matter no matter how small um he'd tell me it was essential that I get this one lab meeting with my PI right and I tell him that he was for sure going to hire whoever he was excited about that day. And he was always excited about someone on some day. Um, you know, on many days I got to text him later that day being like success with many exclamation marks. And on some days I called him and, and broke down disappointed in myself. And he'd suggest I get some sleep and wake up the next day and find another way. Um, some of you in the panel today are my godparents or have welcomed me into your home for extended periods of time, or have been feeding me Parmigiano for a very long time, or you're the reason I fell in love with literature and decided to become an English major in college who happens to also do science. But because of those daily phone calls, I know exactly who every single one of you who spoke today is and what my father admired deeply about you. And let me just say, it, it was a lot. Um, you know, I, I still wake up every morning craving those 6.30 a.m. calls with my best friend. And I wish right now he could help me choose where to go to medical school starting in August or how to draft my summer grant or give me advice about a friend who's struggling. But today I have the conviction that though I'll never get to call him again, whenever I need something I can reach out to every and any single one of you so that I can have the fuel to keep fighting. And along those lines, I want to say that we are not done fighting. We have actually just started our fight in the name of our father. Um, you know, when my father passed away last Sunday, we decided that the best thing we could do for our fighting, for a fighter was to keep fighting. So we have decided to start a GoFundMe for Crossfield Jacob disease uh, research, which is, as many of you know, what, what he died of. And um, I'm going to copy the link below here in case any of you want to donate. We are extremely thankful for all of your support. And we also wanted to say that during this past few months, I know we didn't answer a lot of messages uh, but we read every single one of them and we read them to him out loud. And though he, he at the end couldn't talk, his eyes still sparkled at, at every single one of your words. So thank you for, for giving us all of that. Great, thank you very much, Clara, that was beautiful. Um, we will, so I'm gonna close this tribute uh, Thank you very much for attending. I know we went uh, 35 minutes over, but it was very, very um, therapeutic for myself. Um, and I'm sure it was very therapeutic for the family um, and then probably therapeutic for all of us too. Uh, we, will, we will send out, uh, uh, Clara, for some of the people who may have dropped out earlier, we will send out an email with your link uh, with that GoFundMe. Um, I, I know you, you, it, it's already over 200,000 euros, so it was a big success. Um, so thank you all for contributing. Um, if there are any other stories that you guys wanted to share and did not get a chance, uh, you are welcome to uh, email them to me. Uh, and there will the family is going to work on a memorial website for Jose. And we will post this tribute and also additional memories on the website. So um, so stay tuned for the, for the logistics email for both the GoFundMe and also for additional memories that you may want to share. Um, so. That's that's it. Uh, I hope you all enjoy your Saturday, and and um, thank you very much for attending again. <laughs>